Amid Awahopa, thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. New rules governing how institutions handle Native American human remains and artifacts is roiling tradition-bound museums. The new guidelines for the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, also known as NAGPRA, place Native voices at the forefront, causing many museums to make dramatic about-faces. But not all institutions were taken off guard. Some are working closely with Indigenous communities, hoping to forage a blueprint for others to follow. Stuart Huntington starts our reporting today. The new rule is a sea change. It completely eliminates an institution's unilateral um, uh, power um, over these collections and brings in tribes. Many museums have shuttered displays rather than fall afoul of the new rules. But not everyone was caught flat-footed. Two years ago, the American Museum of Natural History completed a five-year overhaul of its 125-year-old Northwest Coast Hall. Steered by Native guest curators, the project, perhaps, lights up a healing and positive way forward. That's a hall that was renovated about two years ago with real deep consultation and collaboration uh, with representatives of, of tribal communities, with uh, consulting curators who were brought in, uh, a process that reviewed objects. Uh, one of the outcomes of that review is that some objects were repatriated if determined in the, the consultation that it was most appropriate for them to be repatriated. It's earning good reviews from important quadrants. So many Haida from Haida Gwaii Alaska, Seattle, wherever they are, uh, are going to New York and making a point of going to the American Museum of Natural History to see the Northwest Coast Hall, to see themselves in it. Our people love to go there, and I think that's the ultimate test of whether the hall is good or not for us. And the hall is good. Getting there proved bumpy. You know, it wasn't without conflict, but we have mechanisms to address conflict. The conflict is important. You don't learn, you don't grow, unless you can talk through differences, hey? I think we were able to reach, you know, points of agreement, common perspective, um, and, you know, that produced an exhibit that we're all very pleased with. That perhaps lights a healing way forward. Yeah, I think we can get there. We know we've, d we've done it in the past, and and we know we can do it again. The hall was renovated with deep uh, input into how things are displayed, uh, sensitivities around the what could be displayed next to what, or what the framework, or what the, the construct uh, around the display would look like. And to me, that's actually the model of not only what this work should look like, or what the, what the product should be in terms of a, an exhibition hall, but really what the process should be in terms of collaboration between the museum and communities. The Ohio History Connections Museum in Columbus is also looking forward. As part of a 2020 expansion, it reached out to area tribes. The decision was made to expand this, and partially because of the need for that expansion, we had this opportunity to bring in more voices. That inclusivity is now the law of the land, but it's always been just plain good practice, say indigenous exhibit designers. When we're getting into a new project, we put together first a committee within those indigenous communities that we're touching. And we sit down with them, we visit with the artists, we visit with their historians, their elders. We allow them to shape the material that we then interpret and put into the exhibits that we create. In the end, there's something that's far more fascinating that comes out. Now that there's a law in place, I'm hoping that the museums start to figure that out as well. It's not their job to interpret our historical belongings. It's their job to allow us to take those belongings back and then allow us to tell the stories that, that go along with it. Stuart Huntington, ICT News. That was the third segment in our series on the major changes to the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. To see the whole series, read more about these important issues, and watch extended interviews, visit us at ictnews.org. 
We head now to the land of enchantment where the University of New Mexico is celebrating a milestone for one of its degree programs. UNM's Bachelor of Arts degree in Native American Studies turns 20 this year. The university will hold a commemorative symposium next week where alumni will participate in panels discussing how they are applying their NAS degrees in the professional world. The United States only has a few dozen schools in the nation who offer a Native American Studies program like this. Well, a First Nations Olympic athlete is the latest to be inducted into the North American Indigenous Athletics Hall of Fame. Hockey player Kenneth Moore has been honored as one of Canada's first Indigenous Olympic gold medalists. Moore, who is a citizen of the Picasus First Nation, won the medal during the 1932 Winter Olympics. After his storied career, Moore retired and became a coach in his local community. Every year, the North American Indigenous Athletics Hall of Fame inducts around 100 athletes. According to Moore's granddaughter, his induction signals that more First Nation sports heroes need to be recognized. Back in the U.S., one tribal nation in Minnesota is expanding its golf offerings with the top-of-the-line driving range. The Shakopee Midwankaton Sioux community announced its partnership with Canadian company Launchpad Golf in opening a new facility in Prior Lake. The range will be available for all skill levels and will be built next to the tribe's Mystic Lake Casino Hotel and Golf Course. It will offer food and drinks as well as next-level technology included including including heated suites, advanced radar technology, virtual golf courses, and other social games. Construction will begin in the spring of this year and is anticipated to open in 2025.